I think what is te what has taught me to be flexible is pain. If a person doesn't learn how to be like like to let go and be flexible and laugh and don't take life so seriously, you, you literally are going to die. You know, some people do have to live through really tragic situations that are that, that they just don't know how to they don't see a way out. They don't think they're gonna be able to make it. They don't they don't see any hope. They don't know how they can even face another day. It's hard. You know, life can be very hard. I've been thinking a lot, pretty much constantly, about the idea of how a person deals with pain, like deep, pervasive pain. Like I can look back on every single thing of my life, even the things that I don't like at present, well, you know, I'm not too thrilled with. I can honestly say that I'm grateful for those things and that they are serving a purpose. You know, they might be, their, their, their pain has a way of shaping a person, hopefully making that person more generous, more open-hearted, more, you know, more expansive. There's a lot of hope. You know, I've lived through a lot of things where I thought there isn't any hope. Well, I've been blind since birth um, because my sister and I were premature. We were born at six and a half months and we were put it placed in incubator so it damaged my optic nerve. I went away to a school for the blind. I was very well educated. It was very difficult because I was in Philadelphia. My family was here. That was I didn't it was a very difficult way to grow up for me, but I did receive a very good education. But when I was in, 23 years old, I went to Ireland and I was sexually assaulted by a priest there, um, which is it really it's just part of the story. It's not really the biggest part of the story. Um, and I had a very severe struggle at the time trying to get some kind of recognition and justice. It took 15 years. And because the, the case happened in Ireland, none of the church officials wanted to take any responsibility for it. And the Irish superiors didn't, the, the bishop here in this diocese didn't. So I was kind of like just betwixt and between with that, but eventually the Irish superior um, gave me an opportunity to come to Knock to pray in Ireland for reconciliation and healing, and I, and I was very satisfied with that. Well, I think the main thing is that since I was young, very young, I always felt really, I think I was left with a lot of, quote, deficits for a reason. Like, I mean, I went away from home when I was four. I felt really lost when I was young, extremely lost and alone. But even though I felt that way, I guess my faith, I guess you could say it kicked in or whatever, I don't know how to say it. And I just felt like from my youngest days that there was a highest, higher purpose for everything. And I guess I clung to that reality. And because of that, I just had a different outlook on life. And when I was in college, I was pretty convinced that, you know, I was, my, my purpose on this earth was to love God and bring peace and comfort to others, especially to the poor and suffering. So I was pretty, I mean, I was convinced of that by the time I was 17 or something. I guess, I guess at first, like everyone else, I was just shattered. I mean, I was obviously shattered extremely disappointed in the institution. Um, I still think the institution has a long way to go and I'm willing to pursue that if, to stand up for justice if they still stonewall, which it seems like they are. But um, I, I could do that without any bitterness or anything because I realized that we're all just human and we all have our own short-sightedness. So I, I just Having faith in God is different than having faith in, an, in a human institution. And I can, I can accept the fact that we all have problems and limitations and, and just accept that. I mean, I have enough of my own. I, I don't, it doesn't really, it's not gonna disturb me or 
something like that. And faith in God is faith in God. It's a personal relationship with God that's different from the institution. It's completely different. Well, everybody is searching for meaning. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have read the book Man's Search for Meaning. When somebody goes through a tragedy, I mean, the first question anybody would ask is why? And what does it mean? And what, how do I survive? And I mean, the only answers to questions like that are, is that there must be a higher purpose. Otherwise, there'd be, we would all just be in dis utter despair all the time. I mean, I know all about that. But I mean, it's just, there has to be a higher purpose. There has to be a higher sense of meaning. If, if, there, if, if suffering is a part of life, which it is, it can't be avoided, then there must be, we either believe that there's something good that's going to come out of it, or we just, just despair. There's just no other way around it. We either make something good out of it, we believe something good is going to come out of it, we do our best to move forward and build something good out of, you know, beauty for ashes, so to speak, or we just fall into shambles. I mean, it's just one, or, one of the two, and it depends, some of it depends on choice or what a person wants, how motivated they are, what they actually choose. I think those are two big things. Some of it depends on maybe what a person is capable of doing. You know, maybe when two, two different people are hit by tragedies, maybe one person can bounce back and overcome it. Maybe another person just doesn't have the ability to. Some of it is choice, like I said. Some of it is motivation. Some of it is a mindset. Some of it is a person's worldview, but I mean, all that is personal and indiv individual to every person. I mean, I don't know if you can, I can't impose mine on someone else, but I've been thinking a lot, pretty much constantly, about the idea of how a person deals with pain, like deep, pervasive pain, whether it be spiritual, emotional, or physical pain. I do believe there is such a thing as spiritual pain. Obviously, we know about physical pain, and emotional pain is. You know, that's a pretty common thing. Most people go to counselors and things like that for emotional pain, but, you know, and that, that comes from a whole bunch of different reasons. I mean, bereavement, a loss of a relationship, or anything. But I think spiritual pain is even deeper than that. I think it has to do with, well, you could say it's like existential. You could say it's like, well, the meaning of why there is this much tragedy, or it could be loss, a grief, or something. But... The idea that I've been thinking about and writing about, and really, really, this is what I think my, my thrust of my life's work is about. How does a person deal with, quote, chronic, which I'm not too thrilled about, that I, like, I don't like that word because that sounds like it's just never going to go away. Chronic, or let's say intense, constant pain of any kind. And I know that people who have worked in pain management or pain clinics talk a lot about today about the practices of mindfulness and staying in the present moment and embracing what is in the present moment, like not fighting what is, not trying to change it, not trying to judge it, just being present to what is. And that those concepts of mindfulness, being in the present moment, not judging the situation or what I'm feeling emotionally, spiritually, or physically, just accepting it for what it is has is really changing and has changed my life. Really, those are really big key things. Because I don't think there's any way that people can avoid pain. I think that some people have more pain than others, depending on their... I don't really know what it has to do with. I mean, physical, we know it's all different reasons, but why, why a person feels more emotional pain or more spiritual pain than another person could be because they are just maybe they're more empathetic, maybe they're, they have the ability to feel more compassion. I really don't know actually the reason. All I know is what I feel and I can tell you that I feel a truckload of pain every day, every single day. And I have had to learn how to manage it so it doesn't destroy me. So what I'm learning is that the practice of mindfulness, staying in the moment and not judging, not trying to resist something not trying to push it away or saying, I wish this wasn't there, I wish this would just go away or something like that. That only makes it worse. But just being present and just 
not putting a judgment on, not saying like, this is oh, terrible, this is terrible. Just being present to it and, and letting it pass like a wave. Pain, pain is often like waves. You know, it comes, it it's, becomes very intense and then it peaks and crests and like that. So that's what I'm learning. That's one thing that helps me a lot. And then the other thing, I guess, is that there's always a purpose. It might not seem like it, but there is. There's always a purpose for tragedy. There's always a purpose for something. And it always is a good purpose. Like, I can look back on every single thing of my life, even the things that I don't like at present, well, you know, I'm not too thrilled with. I can honestly say that I'm grateful for those things and that they are serving a purpose. You know, they might be, their their pain has a way of shaping a person, hopefully making that person more generous, more open-hearted, more, you know, more expansive or something. It sort of, as crazy as this sounds, just experiencing it fully and just, like, letting it be whatever it is. Not, not judging it, not saying, oh, this, this shouldn't be this way. Because whenever, it seems to me that whenever I put a label on something, or I put a judgment on something, and I say, this is really bad, this should not be this way, or this is terrible, then it seems like it gets worse. Whereas if I just say, okay, this is what it is right now. This is just what I'm experiencing right now in this moment. This is what it is. It's just, a, it's just my present experience. To me, that's a lot easier. It, it's not, it doesn't mean that it, I might not feel pain, but pain can even be broken down into even smaller things. Like emotional pain, for instance, always has a physical sensation to go with it. Like if somebody feels sad, they could either feel that sensation in their body as an emptiness, a weight on their chest, a churning in their stomach, a weight in their head or something. But if you can just break it down to like a small little sensation that you feel physically, when a person has intense pain, the first thing is we get overwhelmed. You know, and it could lead you to despair because it's just, it's just too much. But if you can break it down and realize that every pain starts with a physical sensation and just be present to what is going on I'd, I'd be present to what's going on in my body right now. Do I feel my heart racing? Do I feel a weight on my chest? What is it exactly? And then it's easier to deal with. Instead of every single thing, instead of like all, my, all the things that my mind is saying about how terrible this is and how, you know, all the things that I feel. And it's just like a big, it's too hard to deal with it all. Just breaking it down into little components helps too. And that's what I think I think people in our society are always trying to avoid pain. I mean, that's what we're made, that's what our culture tells us to do. But it gets worse when you, to me, it's like it gets worse when people do that. When I do that, I can't do that anymore. There's just no way to avoid it. Some people live through very painful situations, you know, but it doesn't mean that it's all gloom and doom. It's all, there's, there's a lot of hope. You know, I've lived through a lot of things where I thought there isn't any hope. But that in itself is just a, it's just a, a thought, it's a perspective, it's, it's an evaluation, it's, it's not even true. There's always hope, there's always a solution to everything. We might not like the solution, we might not like the fact that we might have to wait, we might not like that it's going to work out this way instead of that way, but it still can be good, you know, it depends on how a person works with what they have. I'm not saying any of this is easy because it's a, it could be extremely rigorously hard. But if a person has the right tools, and if they have the right support, they could, there are ways of navigating through extreme suffering. And that, that's proven by other people who have navigated through terrible things like concentration camps or imprisonment or, you know, cancer. I mean, even cancer can be very brutal for people and, you know, just, you know, it's all subjective to the person. What a person, what one person goes through for one person could be very brutal. To another person, it could be just, oh, well, that's not that hard. It, it all depends, but everybody at one time or another is going to go through something that they consider to be unbearable or brutal. All this that I'm telling you, because mm -hmm. what after, you know, I've been trying to help somebody that I love in another state who's wrongfully convicted of murder. And... 
as you know, the, the, the legal system, the criminal justice system, there's, it's, it has a lot of good things. There's a lot of good people that are doing good things, but there's also a lot of wrong things. And I've, been, I've, fa I've come face to face with all the wrong things, the corruption, the evil, the lies, the deception, the, I mean, evil. So basically, for two times in my life, when I was a young woman and now when I'm at this age, 54, I'm, I'm struggling against this evil, this terrible component of evil that is so, it's, it's terrible. I mean, it's like, it could really destroy a person if they let it, let's put it that way. I'm referring to the, the fight that, that we're in at this particular time in the justice system, trying to get somebody exonerated who's wrongfully convicted. And all the things that I've personally done to get this to happen, I've done the investigative work on the case, I've raised money for lawyers, um, I've traveled out there, I've supported the family, I've, I've, you know, everything, everything about this case for this particular person. I've lived, breathed, eaten, slept for the past five years, and it's a fight against evil. Just like it was when I was young, fighting against the, 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 the unmovable rock structure of the church that was evil. It's corruption. It's evil. That's what I'm trying to say. And if somebody is dealing with something like that, which I am, which I have and I am, it could be it could destroy a person unless they really have their wits about them, unless they really, you know, try to find tools. Maybe not everybody is called to face things like that, but some people are. You know, some people do have to live through really tragic situations that are that, that they just don't know how to they don't see a way out, they don't think they're gonna be able to make it, they don't they don't see any hope, they don't know how they can even face another day. It's hard. You know, life can be very hard. Okay, so in Ireland I was twenty three years old. I went there to visit a family whom I had met on a religious pilgrimage in Medjugorje. And I went there to visit the family to Cork, Ireland, and the priest uh, for 12 days sexually abused me which culminated in uh, aggravated indecent assault um, at the last day of the trip and that was I was told a couple years later that that was a violent crime I didn't even know what was what I mean I don't know <laughs> but anyway so then I came back here and as soon as I came back it was August of 1988 after the 12 days I was in shock and I um, wrote to the religious superiors in, 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 in America. They, there was, he was part of a religious order, but they had a, a home in America, in New Jersey. I wrote to them. In September, they didn't, they didn't call me back. They didn't acknowledge my letter, so I called them, and they told me it was my imagination. So then I was so flabbergasted, I didn't know what to do. So then I didn't do anything about it at all, because I was in my last year of graduate school. So then I decided that I was just going to try to forget about it because I was so flabbergasted by that answer I didn't know what to make of it so then I think I might have written to the superior in Ireland but I got the same answer around that time I don't know and then in 1991 I went to our bishop because I couldn't get any answer from anybody else and they told me they weren't going to do anything about it because it wasn't their jurisdiction so then I was still I still was like at odds I wrote to the cardinal's office because the priest who perpetrated the crime was in America even though he was Irish they just ignored it so then I didn't do anything until 1993, but I was still just being devoured by it, like just it was consuming me, it was killing me. And I just went back to our bishop. I got a lawyer, went back to our bishop. Do you want to know all this? They went to the hearing. They had oh. a hearing. They, they reviewed the allegations. And then I waited. I never got an answer. They were supposed to tell me whether or not they had a psychiatric evaluation and counseling for, recommended to the order that that's what it would happen. But our diocese didn't follow, follow up on it. So I never heard anything until 2002 when the Boston Globe thing came out. And then I contacted the religious order again and said, please, I need to know what the answer was. And they told me that the priest got a psychiatric evaluation and counseling. And I asked if I could go over and pray with them for closure and healing. And they said yes. And I had to come to terms with the fact that our diocese dropped the ball, which I did come to terms with it. I really believe they did drop the ball. I, I don't. I think they sh could have been and should have been more responsive. But I'm certainly not, you know, holding them to that now. Except for the fact that if they are giving compensation and they're going to ignore vulnerable adults, I am. So, that's that.
I think as a young, I mean, I don't even know if I, how it dawned on me that I was blind. I would try to do things like a regular kid. Like I would run on the street, I would smash into something, and or I would like just try to do things, and I would fall down the steps or something, and I would think, oh, I guess I can't do that. I mean, it seemed like I was always having all kinds of accidents because I wanted to be normal. That was my biggest thing. But then I realized, oh, I guess I'm not normal, or whatever that means. They say normal is the setting on a washing machine. I don't know what normal is. But anyway, I realized, oh, I guess I'm not normal. So then I think when it really dawned on me was like when some kids, my mother worked at a nursing home, and some kids were, we were playing with some kids, and they th started to throw stones at me and call me names like, um, like blindy or something, something's wrong with your eyes or whatever. And I thought, oh, my gosh, there must be something really wrong with me. And I think that that really scarred me because I, I couldn't believe it. Like I thought, oh, I guess I'm really not normal after all. And then I went away to school and I, everything was very abnormal there. It was a very, very like stark place, very institutional, very harsh place to grow up. And I just felt so lost, you know, and, but really what made me feel, no, quote, normal was that I could study. I mean, the school did set up things that we could do things, like we could swim, we could play handbells, we could, they tried to make it as normal as possible, but you knew, I mean, I knew, I grew up knowing that, gosh, something's wrong with me. At least that was the message I got, and it was always like, you have to overcompensate, you have to, you always have to, like, because when you get out into the real world, that was how they put it, you're going to have to do things, like and they put a, they they expect a, us to be excellent at what we did, which is a good thing. Now I appreciate it. At the time, I thought it was a lot of pressure, but I was really afraid to leave the school for the blind because I thought, well, what if I can't adjust? So I would I went to college and I remember carrying the tray in the cafeteria like you'd have a tray of food and you still have to walk and figure out where you are. And I was really afraid. I was thinking I'm going to drop the tray. I'm going to I don't know where the table is. I was like I was I I went through life feeling a lot of like a lack of confidence. I never oozed with confidence. I never felt like, oh gosh, you, you got it, mate. I never felt like that. I felt so weak and so lost. <laughs> so I just really depended on my faith to help me. I depended on God, really. That's why I'm so grateful, because I know that God has done everything for me. I couldn't do anything. So then, and then when I got out of college, I went to graduate school, I wanted to become a nun. And I was under the, the impression that this is what I thought after a while. Well, if you set your mind to something, you can get it done. Well, I didn't realize that the sighted world wasn't like that because they kind of told you, like, just be determined, you'll get it done, and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, when I applied to all those religious communities, I wrote to over 100 of them, and because of the problems that they're having within themselves, a lot of them are older, they don't have the logistics to, to have another person with a disability, they, they wouldn't be able to drive me to ministries and things like that that I would need. Most of them said, we can't accept you because you're a blind person. And the ones that could accept me, I didn't feel like my spiritual gifts matched their, what, they were, what, their, what their spiritual gifts were. So there was literally nowhere for me to fit. Like for years, like for 20, 30 years of my adult life, I just felt like I was drifting around, wondering where in the world, why can't I fit anywhere? And that was because I was blind, I guess. I mean, I don't know. It was just how things worked out. And I was so unhappy about it. I mean, I was... Between the thing with the church and that, I was like, I was like, God, what on earth do you want of me? You know, but it was because I was blind. And I thought the church should have better accommodations, but really, it's just the way structures are. It's, it's when something is very structured, like, like the church, if you don't fit into certain, the structure, you just don't. You know, and now I see that that's a blessing. Before, I thought that that was a curse. I thought, oh my gosh, I don't fit in anywhere. Now I'm so grateful. I'm like, okay, well, I don't fit in. Good. Now I can just do whatever I'm, <laughs> whatever I'm supposed to do in life. I don't have to worry about structures, you know. But for so long, I was so miserable. I was like, well, I don't have any structures and I don't have any support either, which is true. But somehow, I, you know, things are getting done anyway. So I guess long story short about my blindness is that it is a limitation. You know, like, like there are, like this morning, I was trying to dial because I had a problem with my the internet service and I was trying to use the iPhone and I was trying to like dial the numbers on the iPhone but because and you have to put like a pin number in but I, I wasn't dialing it fast enough because I couldn't find the numbers on the phone 
So, but every time I tried to dial it, the phone would disconnect because I couldn't dial it fast enough. And I would say that most of my life, I did not have the skills to deal with that type of frustration because it would be like one frustration after another, like that all day long. Like, where's that paper? Or like I'd give something to somebody that was working in my office and they would lose it because there's so much to keep track of, for instance, with the case that we're dealing with, the criminal case that we're trying to help with. And they would lose the paper because there's so much to keep track of. And because I can't see, I have to rely on other people. And I would be so frustrated, like, why can't I just dial this phone? <laughs> now I'm just, I don't know, for some reason, now it's all just pretty comical. It's like, oh, well, it's not that important. But I didn't, I never had skills to deal with frustration or pain or I would just become frustrated or, you know. So I think when a person has a disability, they, they do have extra things. Things are a lot more... I just have to say, they're they're complicated, you know, and a person has to be, I ha have had to learn and am learning to be very flexible because there's just so many variables in a day that you can't control. Like something as simple as, you know, I can't read the phone book and there's nobody here to read it right now. So I, I can't do what I want to do right now. I mean, that sounds like a little thing, but for me, being the person that I was, very nervous, very uptight, not being flexible, feeling like I had to get a lot done, wanting to succeed. You know, if I have that, if you have that attitude and I'm not flexible, I can't bend. But one thing after another like that, you just have to learn how to be flexible, you know? Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's kind of funny, actually, I think. But I'm learning. <laughs> I think what, is te what has taught me to be flexible is pain. Because if, if, you, if you're suffering to the point where you just feel like you're going to die and you're going to break apart, you either have to learn how to be flexible and you have to learn how to laugh. Me, I have to learn. I'm learning how to laugh. I'm learning how to be flexible. I'm learning how to just really like throw it up to God and say, okay, whatever you want. Let's just have a party here while we're waiting. Because, you know, <laughs> you either have that attitude or you just disintegrate, literally. That's, there's just no two ways about it. There's just really no other way to say it because this thing with this legal struggle that we're going through, believe it or not, has even been more intense than the thing with the assault 20 or 30 years ago. That was, I felt more despair then. This was more high pressure, intensity, panic, st struggle because I didn't, I was doing things I didn't even know what to do. I didn't even know how to do it, but yet I was the one doing the investigative work and I got the case back into court. I don't know how I did it with God's help, I guess, but I was so worried and nervous, like, and it's like, if you don't, if a person doesn't learn how to be, like, like, to let go and be flexible and laugh and don't take life so seriously, you, you literally are going to die. Me, I was, you know what I mean? That's just how it is. Like, I'm not saying I have it all mastered, but I'm getting there. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, if you're, if you're thrown into a, a boiling pot of water, you either learn how to adapt to that or you just burn up. You know, you're thrown into a fire, literally. You're going to learn how.